In 218 BC Europe, there were two power blocks vying for ultimate victory. There was the North African Spanish-based Carthage and the up-and-coming Republic of Rome. After a Roman declaration of war on Carthage, which started the Second Punic War, a powerful general named Hannibal marched an army with elephants across the Alps. Even though the cold and snow caused considerable losses to his army, he was able to make up for them with Gallic allies from the north of the Italian peninsula. The Romans considered the Alpine path that Hannibal took impassable, so they didn't find out about it until his army was in northern Italy. The Roman army met Hannibal in the north. The result was a devastating defeat for the Romans at the Battle of Trebia in 218 BC. Numidian cavalry and Carthaginian light infantry outflanked the Roman infantry and attacked them in the rear. Many of the Roman units collapsed and most Roman soldiers were killed or captured by the Carthaginians, but 10,000 maintained formation and fought their way out to safety. Hannibal and his army made their way south, attempting to gather Italian allies in their fight against Rome. The Romans drafted raw recruits and were reinforced by newly arrived troops from Sicily in order to confront Hannibal with 25,000 men. Hannibal arranged an ambush on the north shore of Lake Trasimene and trapped the Romans, killing or capturing all of them. Several days later, the Carthaginians wiped out the remaining Roman cavalry contingent in the area. Hannibal's army looked unstoppable. Would this be the end of the Roman Republic? Enter Fabius Maximus. In a moment of crisis, the Roman Senate gave him the title of dictator, which gave him all the authority to deal with Hannibal and his army, who were rampaging through the land, plundering as they went. Fabius initiated a war of attrition fought through constant skirmishes, limiting the ability of the Carthaginians to forage for food. Hannibal was the commander of an invading foreign army on Italian soil, effectively cut off from his home country by the difficulty of seaborne resupply. His only hope of destroying Rome was by enlisting the support of her allies. As long as the Italians remained loyal to Rome, then there was little Hannibal could win. Hannibal planned to convince Rome's allies that it was more beneficial for them to side with the Carthaginians through a combination of winning battles and negotiation. Therefore, Fabius calculated that the way to defeat Hannibal was to avoid engaging with him in pitched battles, so as to deprive him of victories. Fabius also determined that Hannibal's extended supply lines and the cost of maintaining the Carthaginian army in the field meant that Rome had time on its side. When the Carthaginians tried to forge for food in the outlying areas, they were met by small Roman detachments. Fabius used interior lines to ensure that at no time could Hannibal march on Rome without abandoning his Mediterranean ports. At the same time, Fabius' armies inflicted constant, small, debilitating defeats on the North Africans, like a pesky mosquito. The foraging parties were denied food and plunder, and it limited Carthaginian supply, which had a long-term effect on morale. Fabius had a healthy respect for Hannibal and his army. He ensured that Hannibal's army was shadowed and avoided an all-or-nothing battle. The Roman army maneuvered in hilly terrain when possible in order to nullify Hannibal's decisive superiority in cavalry. Residents of small villages in the path of Hannibal's army were ordered to burn their crops and take refuge in Roman fortified towns as part of a scorched earth policy. Much of Hannibal's army was made up of Spanish mercenaries and Gallic allies, whose loyalty to Hannibal was dubious, even though they disliked Rome. At that time, the city of Rome was fortified, the Carthaginian mercenaries were unsuited for siege-like battles, having neither the equipment nor the patience for such a campaign. The mercenaries wanted quick, overwhelming battles and raids of villages for plunder and loot, much like land-based pirates. With a lot of patience, Fabius Maximus was able to wear down the Carthaginians over the years. Eventually, Hannibal and what was left of his army was recalled to Carthage, and the threat to the city of Rome was lifted. In history books, this strategy has become known as the Fabian strategy. In the American Revolutionary War, the Continental Army under General George Washington had suffered defeat after defeat and were being chased by the British Army. 
The year 1776 had started out in a promising way for the American cause, with the evacuation of British troops from Boston in March. When George Washington decided that Long Island would be defended against British attack, he played right into the British Army's hands. A lot of effort went into fortifying different strong points. The British Army and Navy were highly maneuverable along the coast, and Long Island was ideal for ships debarking troops. British Army officers were well trained in Army Navy cooperation. British General William Howe had landed troops on Long Island in August and had pushed George Washington's Continental Army completely out of New York by mid November when he captured the remaining troops on Manhattan. Washington retreated with the remnants of the Continental Army, in the process leaving behind most of its munitions and supplies. In early December 1776, the American cause looked bleak. Washington had less than 5,500 men and about 1,700 were sick or wounded. Worse than that, most of the Continental Army's enlistments were expiring at the end of December and almost no one indicated that they would re-enlist. Some had deserted already. The American Continental Army was literally disappearing in front of Washington's eyes. He had to do something fast in order to save the cause. After attacking and winning the battles of Trenton and Princeton, General Washington had restored American morale and shown that total independence was still possible for the colonies. We know that George Washington, like many founding fathers, was familiar with certain Greek and Roman works. For example, Cato was a popular play at the time and he, along with many others, quoted from it in everyday life. According to this article written by Gregory Daler of the Mount Vernon estate, General Washington certainly did use the Fabian strategy against the British. After the battlefield losses, he continued to hang on. Like Fabius, Washington realized both sides' strengths and weaknesses. For example, the British were strong on the coast, but weak and disoriented in the backwoods. The Continentals and militia were the exact opposite, being more comfortable in the forest and the countryside. The British had to deal the American Rebellion a knockout blow in order to win back the colonies. As long as George Washington was in the field, then the American cause still had a chance. In 1777, when the British took Philadelphia, Washington, like Fabius, stayed close to the British, monitoring their movements, but due to his army's weakness, he tried to avoid large all-or-nothing battles until later when the Continental Army was stronger. At Yorktown, General Cornwallis unknowingly fell into a trap, being surrounded by the Continental and French armies and blocked at sea by the French Navy. With this one stroke, America would soon get its independence from Great Britain. It was a pleasure to make this video. If you like this video, then check out two of my other videos on D-Day, What Would Sun Tzu Do? and Should the Continentals Have Retreated from Charlestown in 1780? Thank you for watching. If you liked what you see, hit the subscribe button or share. Thank you. This has been Immersus Tech.